Okay, I've said it before and I'll say it again. King of the Hill is the best show ever. It's quite astounding that a show so grounded in reality was able to enjoy the popularity it has for such a long time. Even today, there seems to be a larger appreciation for this show than there was during its original run. But hey, in a series that spanned 250 plus episodes over the course of over a decade, there's bound to be a few duds. They can't all be winners, right? Now that that's out of the way, here's my list of my top 10 worst King of the Hill episodes. Number 10. Bad News Bill. Baseball season begins and Hank is wary of letting Bobby join the team given his previous record of low enthusiasm for fitness and poor playing. But Bobby still decides he wants to join, so Hank signs him up for a new team in which no one would know Bobby's past history. He tries to warn the coach and as such he decides to encourage Bobby at every turn which seems to yield good results. Hank's excitement is quickly diminished when the new coach ousts him for being unsupportive in front of all of the other parents, earning their ire. See, I haven't given up on Bobby the way you have. Poor kid. Shameful. There should be a law. To make matters worse, Bill is given a job in the league and uses his position of authority over Hank to make his life miserable, to the point where he enjoys rubbing it in Hank's face. I have to go anyway. It's almost time for the game. And unlike some people, I'm allowed to be there. Screw you, Bill. And this isn't even him at his worst. More on that later. This episode seems unnecessarily harsh on Hank, considering his expectations weren't displaced. Bobby's lack of abilities at baseball is something that was established in the very first episode of the series. Something which his own friends don't seem to empathize with him. Also, his expulsion from the league's property doesn't seem fair considering his penalty was just an accident. This episode wasn't as bad as I remember upon rewatching, and the reason why it's so low on the list is because it does shine light on the fact that support to the point of just feeding delusion can be a bad thing. Wait, are you saying you don't believe I can do it? Cause Coach sure thinks I can. Hank didn't just blindly stop supporting Bobby. It came from his ability to see that baseball wasn't right for him and told him to focus on things he's really good at, that it can be bad to set expectations too high too early. I mean, look at the generations that were all given a medal just for trying. Fostering congratulatory behavior for non-congratulatory work can be detrimental in the long run. It's a good message. Number 9. Yarchi Blues, or as I like to call it, the gnome one. Peggy starts feeling down about not having something to brag about with her home, so she decides to purchase a gnome from an estate sale. Hank is uncomfortable, and for good reason. I mean, look at that thing. But he lets her keep it because he knows it makes her happy. One day, Bobby is being Bobby and accidentally breaks a piece off. Rather than fixing it, Hank decides it's a good enough opportunity to get rid of it and convinces Bobby to bury it in the woods. Not only that, but he runs over it with his truck twice overkill much peggy freaks the heck out and impressively deduces that bobby damaged it when hank decides to come clean then she aggressively punishes bobby effectively putting all the blame on him when it was hank's doing to get rid of it entirely peggy really he didn't don't make it any worse for him hank now you go to your room this episode is just an eye roll the whole time Peggy's attempt at growing stuff fails here, but it's clearly shown in other episodes that she's capable with gardening. And her getting crazy mad at Bobby when it wasn't even his fault entirely just seems unfair. All this over a porcelain gnome? I don't understand why Hank let Peggy do that to him. And to add insult to injury, when Bobby facilitates Hank's deed in making it right, she refuses to believe it was him. So, Bobby is blamed for something he didn't do, and is still disregarded when he tries to make it right. This is one of the episodes where I find Peggy at her absolute worst. Now hear me out here. I'm fully cognizant that Peggy has done more egregious things. Stealing Bobby's turkey because she was jealous, accidentally kidnapping a Mexican girl, willfully sabotaging Lucky and getting his GED when he goes to her for help. I'm completely aware of all of that. To me, though, that all fits in her character. She's insecure, she has an inflated ego, she's blissfully unaware of her own incompetence, and she often does misguided things in her head because she feels it's right. In this episode, she's just plain nasty for the sake of being nasty, all over an ugly garden ornament. All in all, not a very good episode. 
but I do like this line. Come back and see us again. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I was talking to Figgleforth. Nailed it! Number eight. Sweet smell of success. Bobby, out of nowhere, starts to develop an interest in football, and Hank is just ecstatic. He goes all out on making Bobby's blossoming football interest as great as possible, before he can lose interest again. Hank decides he's going to take him to a live game to capitalize on this, and it all hits the fan. Dale buys fake tickets, forcing Hank to go to a scalper, and the team isn't playing so well. When Bobby winds up sneaking into a luxury box belonging to the rival team's former quarterback, things just go crazy. The rival team's assistant coach calls the box asking Hank for help, and in some strange turn of events, actually gives a play that hands a victory to the other team. The rest of the episode is just a bizarre escape from the stadium adventure at the risk of their lives. Now look. Even being from Texas and poking fun at the fact that we have a creepy obsession with football, this is just a little much. He was wearing one of those old school jerseys. Like that one! Oh, Lord. Good help! Good help! Oh, look, an innocent man got beaten up because the team lost. Oh, look, a mob is about to attack Dale's car. And Peggy is crazy and destroyed her television when the team lost. My goodness, how much money did Hank blow on this whole endeavor? How many laws did goody goody Hank break just to get Bobby interested in football? You know what, scratch that, that is a very Hank thing to do. This episode is just cringy. It's hard to find humor in this situation when your main characters are being dumb and are at the risk of getting seriously hurt by a zealous mob. Why didn't Hank and co just leave as soon as the game was lost? Why stick around for the aftermath in a place they weren't supposed to be? Fans of a losing team aren't going to want to deal with that. And the entire ordeal is just pretty much undermined by the fact that Hank explains to Bobby at the end there is always other games to look forward to, and that losing a game isn't the end of the world. That's it. Number 7. Enrique Silable Differences Fans of the series are familiar with Hank's co-worker Enrique, voiced by Danny Trejo. He's mostly just a background character that you see when Hank is at work, with a few exceptions. But in this episode, Enrique slowly begins to creep more and more into Hank's home life, months to his chagrin. At Peggy's urging, Hank finds out that he and his wife are having domestic issues, and for some reason starts unloading on Hank. I don't know. Maybe it's because when, when I married Yolanda, I, I was a virgin. And she wasn't. <sighs> Peggy continues to push Hank into trying to help him work things out, but it exacerbates the situation. Finally, Hank has enough and decides that the best way to help is to not help at all. This culminates in Enrique going to their home in the middle of the night and effectively trying to break in. There are a few episodes of any show that I simply cannot watch more than once. This episode straight up just makes me uncomfortable. It may stem from my fear of strangers or acquaintances being overly friendly with little to no provocation, or my fear of home invasion. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy when shows flesh out satellite characters more. It helps with the world building. But this episode just got a little too real for me. If you want a good Enrique-centered episode, watch the gentrification one, where his admiration of Hank isn't nearly as creepy. Not really much more to say. Danny Trejo gives a great performance and is a terrific human being. That's it. Next! Number 6. Hank's Bully. A new set of neighbors move in and their mischievous kid starts playing increasingly damaging pranks on Hank. He tries to tell the parents, but they play it off that their perfect little kid is just messing with him because he likes him. It's more like harassing. That's just his way of testing you. After a particularly intense exchange, Hank takes the kid's bike and has the cops called on him. Now, feeling completely powerless, he decides to use Bobby to start harassing the kid's dad and refusing to call him off when the dad complains. Hello, Jim and Lila. What brings you here? Your son is out of control. Yep, Bobby's got a lot of spirit, all right. Spirit? He spread trash all over our yard and viciously attacked Jim. Well, he must really like you a lot. 
this episode is a pretty good example of those parents who think their kid can do no wrong and let them continually harass people because they're never told no or are disciplined. While Hank's behavior isn't that different from someone that is being bullied, I don't understand why Hank didn't more aggressively tell the parents or the kid to back off. I mean, Hank had every right to sue for the damages when he stuck that garden hose in his mail slot. I mean, heck, that's also destruction of property. Peggy wouldn't take that lying down. She'd definitely go to them and raise her own hell. This is just a frustrating episode to watch, but at the very least, you get a satisfying conclusion. Dusty old bones full of green dust. Dusty old bones full of green dust. I mean it, son. Get off the grass. Bobby should have shot them anyway. Just saying. Number five. What makes Bobby run? Now we're crossing the threshold from frustrating to just plain angry. Bobby tries out to be the new school mascot and succeeds, even getting Hank to help him make a prop for him, telling him that playing the mascot is a great honor. Great! What he doesn't tell Bobby is that it is a school tradition to get beat up by the rival team's band if they are losing after the second quarter during halftime. No, whooping, as in the big beat down, as in halftime hammering, as in the McManaberry mascot massacre, as in- Am I missing something? Whenever Arlen is winning, it's a tradition for the McManaberry band to charge the Longhorn and give him a pounding. It's a real crowd pleaser. Bobby understandably decides to run away and is then ostracized and even bullied by everyone for not taking the beating. Okay, where do I even begin with this episode? There's just so many things wrong here. First off, for such a supposed long-standing tradition, it's astounding that Bobby didn't know about it or that nobody told him when he wanted to try out. Secondly, in what world would so many people be okay with the kid in a costume taking a beating by a group of other kids at a junior high football game? The resentment towards Bobby is just so sickening, even from his own father. If anyone yells, there's Bobby Hill's parents, just start to look around saying, where, where? Thirdly, there was no lesson to be learned at the end because it just ends up with Bobby getting beaten down anyway, this time by the rival football team itself, sparking a new tradition of two beatdowns. Okay, so look, I had been planning on doing this list for a while, as far back as when I made the subtle brilliance of King of the Hill. I just sort of forgot about it, but it wasn't until recently I heard a story of a similar thing happening in real life in which a high school student in a mascot costume was beaten down by a mob of other teenagers and suffered brain damage. And don't try and tell me that the tradition was likely a pretend beatdown. At no point is it mentioned that it's all for show. It's all quite clear that it's an actual beating and has been going on for years. How could this continue for so long? Are we to believe that no one was seriously hurt even during all this time? That no one had the sense to say, hey, this doesn't seem right. About the only thing redeemable about this episode is Bobby being awesome at the end and that armadillo in a sweater is really cute. I like the name Mr. Cracker so much that I named my stuffed penguin that and I've slept with him every night since early 2007. No joke. Number four. New Cowboy on the Block A former Dallas Cowboy moves onto the block, much to the delight of the guys. However, his partying and obnoxious lifestyle grate on Con quickly, but Hank defends him at pretty much every turn. Soon, however, the football player's hostile behavior becomes too much for Hank to ignore, so he calls the police. They, too, are enamored by the football player and refuse to believe Hank. You do realize that this is a felony, Sweet Betty, that's a Super Bowl ring. Things only get worse for the neighborhood and everyone else when his behavior becomes increasingly aggressive and destructive. Finally, they are able to get him to leave by blackmailing him. Kill him, Hank. Bill's got your back. Wow, there's quite a few football-related episodes on here. Besides the frustrating lack of help Hank gets from the fanboy police, despite his continuous complaints, this episode is just a chore to watch. It's the same thing over and over. Football player is a jerk and Hank winds up paying for it despite him being the one to call the police. He even takes a punch to the face. 
I have a hard time believing that Hank couldn't press charges then and there, picture or not. The football player says he can't afford another assault charge, meaning he most definitely has a record. Maybe he moved to the small town like Arlen, knowing he'd have more clout there? I don't know. It's annoying that Hank uses this as leverage to get the guy to move out, lest he pressed assault charges. No, Hank, you still should have, otherwise he'll just move and do it again to somebody else. Possibly even worse. Well, at least this episode has one of Dale's most iconic moments ever. Squirrel tactic! <laughs> Number three, Life a Loser's Manual. Luann's father, Hoyt, returns from his long stint at an oil rig and quickly begins showing unfavorable behavior, including not recognizing his own daughter. It's revealed he is on his second strike, meaning if he commits one more felony, he will go to prison for good. He quickly falls back into his old ways and robs a restaurant and persuades Lucky to take the fall. Not deterred by his close call, he is already planning on who else could take a fall for him, which he reveals to Bobby. I was talking to Uncle Hoyt. Is it true if I got caught in a crime, they'd let me go because I'm just a kid? Why did he tell you that? He says the system is surprising. Like, he says Luann would never go to jail because a jury would think she's too pretty. Realizing that Hoyt is beyond saving, Hank and Peggy facilitate a situation in which Hoyt will offend again, and when he is caught, he decides to confess to his other crimes as well, absolving Lucky of his confession. Okay, so here's the deal. For such a long-running show, King of the Hill has had some impressive displays of continuity, especially in the earlier seasons. For example, Khan mentions in his first episode that he lived in California. In a much later season, he talks about leaving Anaheim. And in another episode, Connie's cousin visits from LA, which is in the same area. So in seemingly throwaway lines, Khan's backstory checks out consistently. However, with the show that runs this long, there are bound to be some holes, and I could pick out pretty much all of them. But they're innocuous. They do not change much to the show. This, however, has got to be one of the most egregious examples of major retconning in any series I have ever seen. Since episode one, the very first episode of the series, it was established that Luann started living with the Hills because her parents had a fight in which Luann's mother stabbed her father with a fork. This happens during the course of the first episode. Her mother goes to prison, which is the plot of its own episode, and her father works out on an oil rig, swearing he won't leave until he knows for sure his ex-wife is dead. And this isn't just brought up in passing, it's referenced several times. In fact, Hank talks about knowing his brother-in-law well, even knowing a girl he was supposed to marry before he married Luann's mother. And it's not just Hank. Luann was in high school when she moved in with the Hills. She had to be at least 17. How on earth would her father look at her like he doesn't recognize her? How would she not have known he went to prison too? The writer of this episode, Dan McGrath, began writing episodes for King of the Hill in season 7 when the series took a notable dip in quality, at least in my opinion. This episode came out at the end of season 12, and at no point until then is it ever even hinted that Peggy's brother was in prison or was any sort of criminal. In fact, in the previous season, Luann's backstory is further referenced when she says she had to miss prom because she had to testify at her mother's trial. So there's little to no excuse here. I'm just baffled at why this episode even exists the way it does. They could have easily shoehorned in another family member, or at the very least, have Hoyt act like he's only been gone for four years. To disregard 12 seasons' worth of continuity for this one episode makes this one of the worst ever. And it only gets worse from here, folks. Number two. Aprehank le deluge. Did I say that right? Whatever. A flood hits the town of Arlen and Hank is scrambling to get everyone to the shelter, even going so far as to saving Bill from drowning himself in his own bed. Through a misunderstanding, Bill becomes the de facto shelter leader and Khan begins scheming to work his way into a position of power. Meanwhile, Hank is caught up at a dam, finding that its officer has abandoned his post. 
Through a few tense moments, Hank decides to open the floodgates lest the dam collapse and cause much more damage. He makes it to the shelter, and when his actions are revealed, he is reviled as a flutter, even by the officer who abandoned his post. Bill only serves to exacerbate this and begins blaming Hank for all of the consequences of his poor leadership skills, even going so far as to locking Hank in a cage and keeping everyone locked in the shelter for up to two days. This episode has Bill at his absolute worst. I can understand him coming into the position with the best of intentions, but when he sees he's universally adored and has some sort of authority, he immediately dumps on Hank. Not to mention the entire shelter turns on Hank for opening the floodgates, even by the officer that abandoned his post. Come on, people. I've known Hank Hill almost all my life, and if he was afraid... I was not afraid. I had a difficult decision to make, but I weighed the choices and I acted. In other words... Hey, you take that noise back. You don't know anything about this because you left your post. Yeah, well, maybe if I'd stayed at my post, we'd still have an outlet mall. Why did you leave then? Why don't you ask him that, Hank? This episode crosses from the frustrating to the bizarre to the downright angry. Bill locks him in a cage, for goodness sakes, and when he gets out, he's put back in, and Khan gets his own small authoritative position back. And even now, with the depleting resources within the shelter, Bill starts blaming Hank for being responsible. Well, uh, we had plenty, but Hank ate him. <gasps> Look, I understand the metaphor here, the corrupting nature of power, especially for someone as weak-willed as Bill. But come on, Bill is straight up kidnapping Hank and lying to everyone and getting away with it. I wouldn't have this episode up so high on the list if it didn't end with Hank praising Bill for doing a good enough job and keeping everyone safe. Hank, he wasn't keeping everyone safe in the days where there was no rain or flood. He was just desperately trying to hold on to his own meager slice of authority and would have continued to do so if you didn't call him out on it. He likely would have done it until all the food ran out. If this episode had ended with at least the officer being reprimanded for abandoning his post or Bill getting a well-deserved ass-kicking from Hank and Bill begging for forgiveness, I'd probably have it a lot lower, possibly not on this list at all. But no, this episode is just bad. I said it before and I'll say it again. Screw you, Bill! Right, before we move on to some honorable mentions, I just want to say thank you for watching. Next, you've likely been waiting for some of your own least liked episodes to appear on this list. I'm going to say here right now, popular entries on Worst King of the Hill picks such as Lupe's Revenge, Uh Oh Canada, and Mrs. Wakefield are absent. Lupe's Revenge falls so far out of the realms of plausibility for me to even take that episode seriously. Are we to believe that a bus full of children would be able to go in and out of the U.S. without passports, much less bring a native Mexican back? Not just that, but the episode shows Peggy at least getting arrested because of her own ignorance, so that's a plus. Uh-oh, Canada I thought was okay. It is interesting seeing a straw man like Hank from another country go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. And Mrs. Wakefield was saved by the fact that when Hank finally decides to give in to her demands, it's in front of his friends during a party, showing them how ridiculous her request is. And Hank also acts kindly towards her in the end, knowing that she didn't mean him any real harm. Don't get me wrong, those three are definitely weaker episodes, but not to the point where they make me angry. Lucky's Wedding Suit. Intended to be the series finale, this episode showcases Luann and Lucky in a bad light. They decide to make a frivolous lawsuit just to have an extravagant wedding at the expense of Hank's employer. Not even sure how they would be able to swing that. That's not terribly out of character for them, but Peggy, who is supposed to be a bit more cautious when it comes to her niece, is enabling them at every turn to waste money. Ugh. Dale Be Not Proud. I may be in the minority on this one, but this episode just pisses me off too. This is the one where Dale opts to donate a kidney to a famous race car driver in exchange for stuff while giving Hank power of attorney while he recovers. But after the operation, the doctor reveals he didn't need the kidney after all and manipulates Hank into turning it over to a complete stranger. I get the feeling the doctor made up the whole thing about John Force needing a kidney just so he could get his hands on one, but at least Dale in the end made the decision for himself. A rover runs through it. 
Same issues I had with Life a Loser's Manual. This episode ruined a lot of established continuity with Peggy's family. Up until this episode, it was implied that Peggy's mother lived near Arlen at some point, though others, it shows her living in Montana. So perhaps the continuity isn't as tight with regards to Peggy's family, but what we could gather about her appearance and personality was all done away with in this episode. But at the very least, this episode shows that Peggy can be capable enough in her own right, and the ending is just great. Straight as an arrow. Same thing. Bobby was already a member of the Boy Scouts-like group, but in here it's implied he's never been in it before. A lot of episodes that mess with the continuity end up on this list. And notice they're from much later seasons where the new writers were onboarded. Have some respect for the source material. Three Men and a Bastard, or The Untitled Blake McCormick Project. In this episode, Bill dates a single mother with two children, one of which is the child of John Redcorn and the same age as Joseph. This episode just annoys me in that Dale facilitates their breakup by getting the woman to cheat on Bill with John Redcorn. While she's out getting busy, she leaves her children to be taken care of by Bill. What a bitch. Bill didn't deserve that. And because he's on full-time childcare duty, he decides it's best that she leaves because he was sick of taking care of them all the time. Eh. And the number one worst King of the Hill episode is... That's my purse! I don't know you! you... <laughs> Just kidding! Peggy makes the big leagues. Peggy lands an extended substitution gig at the local high school and finds that the star football player is having trouble doing his work. Peggy makes a concerted effort to help him, but he winds up failing the test anyway, and he receives a failing grade, forcing him out of important upcoming games due to the no-pass, no-play rule. This earns the ire of everyone at the school and the football team's booster club, forcing them to find a workaround to get the player back on the team. Oh boy, this episode is a doozy. First off, I'm aware that Peggy is hated by a lot of people, and I can understand why. Personally, while I found her to be annoying at the most of times, there are also other times that she can do good and even badass things. But okay, let's just say Peggy is the worst thing to ever happen to the show and should get whatever she deserves. Fine. But what about here? Peggy was just doing her job. In fact, she was doing more than just her job. She was taking an active role in helping the student understand the material and is getting crapped on at every turn. And to her credit, Peggy stands her ground when she gets bullied into fixing the grade. This is about David, isn't it? David did failing work. He got a failing grade. Of all people, I would expect my fellow educators to support me. Yes, Peggy, that's right. Football is an extracurricular activity that uses school resources. It is secondary to the school curriculum. If you can't hold up your end of the deal and do passable work, you shouldn't be allowed to participate in the extra. The hoops the booster club jumps through to get him back on the team is just astounding. Hank gives the football player an easy assignment to get a passing grade simply by writing what he likes most about propane. All right, let's see what we got here. Okay, Strickland Propene does not have a vending machine. It smells, and I thank God every day I get home that I didn't get exploded. The end. Pure poetry. And to keep Peggy from going to the school board, the booster club and the boy's mother try to discourage her by making it seem like the football player, David, is learning disabled. Sports is all God gave David, and it's the only way he'll get to college. Um, okay, so a guy that can't even spell propane is going to do well in college? You just know there's going to be an overzealous anti-football professor that'll fail him as well. And what if David gets a career-ending injury? Then he'll have nothing. In the end, though, he confesses to Peggy that his learning disability was a lie, taking offense to the fact they made him look like a fool just so he could play football. He maturely requests Peggy to teach him the work he failed to understand before, understanding that it is wise to have something to fall back on in case football doesn't pan out. So she takes him to see Hank to learn how to deal with propane. So I could forgive this episode in its entirety if that was the case. But this episode just pisses me off with this one line here. Yeah, though, uh, the principal kind of threw out your F. So right now, uh, he's on honor roll. <laughs> wow. Just wow. Then why the hell was it such a big deal in the first place? 
Why give David the secondary class? Why give Peggy hell? Why remove David from the games if the grade could just get thrown out anyway? I just can't understand the logic of this episode. Even if you hate Peggy and feel she deserves the hate she gets, you have to admit she was in the right here. Ugh, I, I can't. I just can't. But one of the only saving graces in this episode is that David is voiced by Brendan Fraser, who is just a terrific human being. And I know that he voiced another character in the show a few seasons later, but this was probably one of my favorite performances by a guest speaker, next to Snoop Dogg. Well, there you go, folks. Those are my top 10 worst King of the Hill episodes and my explanations as to why. Feel free to leave a comment below if you agree or disagree with me, or feel free to share your least favorite episode of the series. I'll be happy to hear it. Um, I may make a top 10 best King of the Hill episodes video somewhere further down the line, but if you're looking for more consistent content from me, please feel free to follow me on my Twitch channel, and we can talk about King of the Hill as much as you want there. I'll leave a description below. Thank you for joining me. My name is Harvey McLeod, and I'm here to make videos for you, and I will see y'all next time. Bye-bye!